We are John and Ellie, the Barefoot Doctors. We lost our new Leopard 50 catamaran to fire, so we began our search for the perfect performance catamaran for selling us around the world. After four decades of selling experience, we are very clear about what we want. So join us as we explore new horizons, stretch the boundaries in yacht design, and build the ultimate catamaran. Jump on board for this adventure, and together, who knows what we can achieve? <laughs> because life is better barefoot. Hi guys, welcome back. And this is a really exciting episode because this is where we actually start building the Portofino 52. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the first cutting of the bulkheads for the Portofino 52 are being done today. And that is phenomenally exciting. The build of the 52 has started. Yay! Whoa! everyone I'm Martino Portofino Marine Service today we are going to show you a very very special things I'm here in the car with uh, Raffaele hello everyone uh, we are going today to show you something really special we are going to bring you in the cutting place where the laser cut of the aluminium is going to start for the building of uh, Portofino 52 Ailey and John's boat. Stay tuned and follow us and you will see something special today. So we are in the cutting place. This is the amazing machine there, and it's going to do the cutting of our aluminium laser cut. And Martina is going to explain you now how it's happening and uh, what we are going to do today. Hello guys, we started with a 4 meter by 2 meter length of aluminium plate. This is a 6 mm thickness. Then we started the, the cutting of this as the two compared that is a sailing catamaran. So the material is aluminium 5083 inch 116. This is the aluminium that we are using for the construction of this catamaran. So, very, very important moment today. is the first aluminium of the Portofino 52 number one the first one Phenomenal stuff and we are very very excited still have to wait a little while for them to finish the boat but hey Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> so talking about Bulkheads, there are 52 bulkheads in the Portofino, which means if there's two holes, they're every two foot, yeah? Yep, yep. So right. that's how many bulkheads you should have, technically. That's well, it's all to do with what material you use and how far apart the bulkheads or the frames are placed. Well, let's talk about bulkheads because there's such controversy and there's kind of a hot topic and have mm. been for a little while, and we won't mention any names. So you like to live on the edge, do you? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I mean, we're talking about the bulkheads. I suppose there's a lot of lack of clarity over what bulkheads represent on a boat. And even some of the comments coming out of the major brands are absolutely ludicrous. For example, one of the manufacturers said to one of the owners of, of their boat, one of the bulkheads on their boat was not structural. Now, this is absolute garbage. Every single bulkhead on your boat is structural because it is an integral part of the strength and the structure of your catamaran. Bulkheads are so important in catamarans because they are basically the only things that are holding the two hulls together. Now, because you have two hulls going through the water and the waves at different times, there are enormous torsion effects. So the boats twist up and down and also sideways because the two hulls are being forced in and out by the waves or up and down. Added to that, you have the mast in the middle between the two hulls and the shrouds that are pulling the hulls outwards while the mast is pushing down in on the bridge deck midway between the two hulls so the first bulkhead that is absolutely most important is the main bulkhead that supports the mast 
So the mast bulkhead always has to be the strongest. So the weight of the mast and the weight of all the sails and the shrouds is distributed laterally uh, and taken up in the hulls of the boat. One is the material that it's made from. The second thing is how much of that material you use or the thickness of your bulkheads. And the third factor is how it's bonded to your hulls because for it to work, it has to be strongly enough bonded to your hulls that any movement that is trying to occur doesn't actually separate the hulls from the bulkheads, otherwise it's completely useless anyway. If you look at your bulkheads on your boat that you have, are they an inch? Are they three or four inches? Now, just to give you some reference, the 42 foot performance cap that I built had the main bulkhead was four inches of wood plus two layers of nine millimeter ply on both sides. This is the main bulkhead under the mast, plus it was attached to the hull with epoxy glue uh, for that whole thickness, plus three layers of glass around all of the edges. I then was looking at other boats and I went aboard a lagoon and the lagoon bulkhead was um, an inch it was only an inch and this and this was 20 years ago um, but the the bulkhead was only about an inch thicker to me at the time and this was a long long time ago I thought gee that's really strange but I kind of just let it slide you need to look at the thickness of your bulkheads and that will give you an indication of how strong it is if your bulkheads only have a small margin of safety when things get rough for example you're going in a really big storm you're being hit by big waves you hit the ground or you hit whales then it's much more likely to break if you don't have any reserve safety capacity you need to be able to look at the bulkheads of the boat you're going to buy so you can decide for yourself if you think that is a good strong bulkhead or is it not so there's a lot of talk about bulkheads but there's not a lot of talk about how many bulkheads you need or, or what they actually do. I think I'm gonna back off and not talk so much and let John talk because he has not only built his own boat but he's had 50 years of sailing experience. So he's been around the traps a fair bit. So I'm gonna let you talk. The other reality is the longer you sail, the more likely something's gonna happen. For whatever reason, you might have engine failure, you might be in a storm, you might drag, you are likely to be in a situation where your boat is under stress. For example, hitting the bottom, hitting a whale, hitting a, a container or something of that nature. So you really wanna make sure that your boat is sound and, and strong enough to sustain those kind of traumas. Otherwise, life might become a little bit hectic. So if you could explain to people about the, what the shrouds do on a catamaran as opposed to a monohull and what they what the torsion does and yeah, all that sort the, of thing. Between the two hulls. Go ahead. The two main factors are you have two hulls that are separate with a mast in the middle and shrouds coming up from the outside. So what's happening, the forces are very obvious. The, the hulls are trying to do this and it's only the bulkheads that are stopping that movement. So that's purely the shroud. So the stronger the wind, the more force that's going through the shrouds that are holding the mast up and all of the force from the sails and whatever the wind strength is, is all going to the outside of your hulls, trying to pull your hulls apart. The second major tension on the boat is you've got two hulls going through the water. This hull hits um, a wave or goes up. This hull isn't, or this might even be going down. And then that gets to the top of the wave and this one goes up to the top of the wave. And then that one comes up and you, your boat is trying to do this all the time. Those forces are absolutely immense. But the other thing that make the forces on catamarans so much greater is that because the catamarans don't heal or tilt over they don't spill the wind whereas in a monohull you get hit by a gust a monohull leans over you spill the wind the forces are less the gust goes away and you come back upright if you're in a gust in a, in a catamaran you don't lean over and so your force just increases exponentially because there is no give in the mast or the sails your boat has to be strong enough to deal with those increased forces and that is why the rigging on a catamaran and the strength of all the gear on, on the mast has to be so much greater in a catamaran. So all of these factors are contributing towards the forces on a catamaran being absolutely enormous. And that's why you need to have the strength and integrity inside of your hull to be able to, and that's basically I'm coming down to the bulkheads, to hold the two hulls securely, not be pulled up by the shrouds, not be torsioned or affected by movement of the two hulls through the water at different times. The other 
things that will put torsion through your boat is when you go into a sail lift. So you, you, you put your boat up out the water, the slings go under the boat, and then that's compressing your hulls. So again, your bulkheads are absolutely integral to holding your hulls together at that point. And also, when you beach the boat, the boat sits down on the sand, and sometimes the sand isn't going to be absolutely even. Your boat has to be strong enough to do that. This is why the bulkheads are absolutely fundamental to the integrity of your catamaran. So, well said. <laughs> so that's why it's so important guys, this isn't rocket science, this is something that's often overlooked by many people because I think oh, everything's good, but clearly we've seen with the history of the last 10 years, everything is not good in the world of bulkheads. <laughs> Now, I just want to talk a little bit more about the bulkheads in each boat. Most boats will have, as I said, the main bulkhead underneath the mast. You have another bulkhead to the forward end of the boat, usually at the front end of the bridge deck, uh, holding the two hulls and the bridge deck together. Then you have a bulkhead behind the mast. So that's usually at the back end of the saloon. And that's usually where the shrouds are attached because the shrouds have to be attached to a very powerful or strong point. It's usually attached to the bulkhead at the back of the saloon and then you have a fourth main structural bulkhead which is usually at the back of the cockpit. Now this is a low one, it's not a high one like the ones going through the back of the saloon because you've got a standing headroom there. So the back bulkhead is low and the other two bulkheads in the middle are high and then again the front bulkhead at the front of the bridge deck is also a low bulkhead. Those are the four main bulkheads that are holding the two hulls together and they prevent the torsion. As well as that within each hull you have bulkheads or frames that create the shape of the hull and as we've said we have 52 bulkheads on our 52 foot boat and there's two hulls so that means we have one bulkhead or one frame every two feet and these are in aluminium so that makes it really really strong. Mm -hmm. I'm led to believe that actually where the bulkheads join in aluminium is actually stronger than the aluminium the flat aluminium itself because you've got that more thickness. Yeah, yeah. So uh, where you have welding, you're adding extra aluminium, um, and it creates an almost a rounded fillet. And when when you use glass into a square corner, you round it off with epoxy, and you make a curve, and and that curve creates much better strength, and that's called a fillet. When you have a weld, you're actually filling in that that right angle corner with welding and you create essentially a small fillet there with metal so that's why it is said that where there is a weld in aluminium it's actually many times stronger than the aluminium itself so i don't know about you guys but i think that's really important stuff and you just don't get that information around the place so that's why we felt it was really important to have this this episode about bulkheads so if you like what we do guys and you want more of it if you can subscribe if you haven't subscribed and ding the notification bell and like and that would be fantastic because it does really help the channel out because it it actually reaches more people and I think more people need to know this sort of stuff so let's talk about watertight bulkheads okay so We've talked about how the bulkheads hold the catamaran together. The other very loosely used term is watertight bulkheads. Watertight bulkheads are bulkheads that help to prevent water flowing from one section of a boat to another. And obviously they're there for protection because if you get a hole in one part of your hull and you've got watertight bulkheads, only that section of the boat will fill up with water and you won't sink. If you look at your boat, how many bilge pumps does your boat have? If your boat only has a bilge pump in the main areas of your hull and all the water from the hulls drain to that one point, then your bulkheads are not waterproof. So the majority of brands of production boats have one bilge pump in the lowest point of the hull and they have holes in their bulkheads to allow the water to drain from any points in the hull to that one bilge pump. That completely defeats the whole purpose of having watertight bulkheads because if you get a hole in your boat then the whole hull will fill up with water and you will potentially sink. If all of your sections are connected then your bulkheads are not watertight. I must say I get quite irritated by uh, salespeople in the boat shows that say these are watertight bulkheads. I have looked at them and they are not watertight. You need to have a check of your boat to see if, if your bulkheads are actually watertight or not. So how many um, bilge pumps 
are we going to have? The Portofino 52 will have four different watertight sections in each hull and we're going to have eight bilge pumps. So one bilge pump for every section uh, as well as in front of those watertight bulkheads we're going to have two separate crash bulkheads which are also watertight. Just to make this talk a reality, just this week there was a mayday going out because some yacht out there had actually either crashed into a whale or the whale had cap crashed into them and so they sent a mayday out and the boat was sinking and obviously the the more watertight bulkheads you have the less likely it is that your boat will will actually sink unfortunately we had friends doing the arc and the, a boat sunk uh, in exactly the same way on hit a container actually was that a container yeah. was it yeah so these risks are out there and and i mean my view is that certainly cats should have airtight voids as well as watertight bulkheads and I know we've been banging on about that we before have. but that is really important. You know? I'd like to point out one other safety factor that's that we've discovered in one of our two ground, groundings over these 40 years. If your bilge pumps are wired with a joint somewhere along the wire and that's exposed to the water, if the water gets above that level your bilge pump will stop working because the salt water will conduct the electricity between those two connections, your built pump will stop working as soon as it's needed. You want these built pumps, the electric built pumps to continue to work. The other really important factor which is needs some thought about is what is the capacity of your built pump. So if you if you have a hole this big in your hull because you've hit something sharp and you've only got a small hole, will your built pump actually be able to pump out the amount of water that's coming out from a hole that's bigger. If you want to have added safety, you need to look at the capacity of your bilge pumps and make sure you have high capacity bilge pumps or you have a separate bilge pump that you put. And that's something which we're going to definitely have is a high volume water pump that we can use with a long pu um, pipe down into the, the bottom of one hull and pump out at large volume the water from the hulls. But we can also do it the other way around where we, if we have a fire, we can use it as a fire extinguisher. Oh, we'd never have a fire. Oh yeah, no, the fires just don't happen on boats, we know that. So. Well guys, we're all about safety, as you can see. And, but losing our 50 has given us the opportunity to really hone down on exactly what it means to have a safe vessel. And so this is what we're doing. So we can sleep better at night. It doesn't mean that you won't have any accidents on board, but what it does mean is that you can minimize risk as best you can, and that is in your control. Okay guys, uh, <laughs> the other thing we thought might be interesting is we want you guys to guess where we are uh, filming this episode. So um, there's not a lot of clues, but there was background noises, and there is some architectural appearances that you might be able to pick up. See if you can pick up the accent <laughs> of the birds. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Elizabeth saw a film and she said, oh, that's in, that's in France because she recognised <laughs> the particular birds that were singing in the bushes, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and the seagulls in different countries have a different song as well. They do. So they have a different call. When you've been around the world a, a bit, you can kind of pick up the different sounds of the different seagulls and the different birds, so it's quite interesting. So just put it in the comments below where you think we might be. And, and there's a prize for the winner. <laughs> so guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope it's been useful for you. So in the next episodes, we'll keep you up to date with the progress of the 52. It's a very exciting journey and we'll also continue to discuss lots of interesting stuff about construction, safety and sailing the world. So all the best guys, see you in the next episode and all the best. Bye from us. Thanks for watching guys and if you like what we do, show us the love and hit the like button. Then hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell as well so you don't miss out on your regular fix. Then kick off your shoes and you can come barefoot with us.